So um, I look forward to these events, uh, getting out of the studio, seeing all of your faces, especially coming out of the pandemic, but learning so much about what's happening in our area with the city, county, and the schools. Uh, of course, we know that so much changes here so quickly, and it is just such a fast-growing area, and with that comes a lot of wonderful things and a lot of challenges. So we're going to hear about a lot of those things today. We have a very exciting program for you today that will include insight from Raleigh Mayor Mary Ann Baldwin, Wake County Commission Chair Stig Hutchinson, and Wake County Board of Education Chair Lindsay McAfee. And following their remarks, we're going to do a Q&A session with all three officials, and we will be um, asking you if you have any questions to uh, take part in that as well. So throughout the program, if you start to have any questions, jot them down or just uh, make a mental note because you will have an opportunity to ask your speakers today. So uh, before we get started, of course, we know the importance uh, of working in partnership with the business and community leaders here, and they make these events possible, city and county decision makers as well, to further develop the thriving economy that we know here in uh, Central North Carolina to enhance the community and, of course, the quality of life. So we want to recognize our event sponsors that are a big part of all this collaboration. I'm going to take a moment to recognize and thank each of the sponsors today. So I want to get started with our bronze sponsors, Aetna, Clancy & Thays Construction Company, Dewberry, William Peace University, Martin Marietta, and We Work for Healthcare North Carolina. Thank you to our bronze sponsors. And the copper sponsor today is Brady, and of course the media sponsor would be ABC 11, so we're honored to help with that today. Please give me a round of applause for all the sponsors making this possible. I also would like to recognize our elected officials and our county and municipal staff that are with us today. We're very fortunate to have a number of public sector partners in the audience as well. We appreciate all the important work that you do on behalf of our city, county, and region. So if you are an elected or appointed official or government staff, please stand and be recognized so we can give you a round of applause. For your time. Thank you. Finally, we would love for you to get social at this event today and also uh, give any feedback. If you're on Twitter or any of your social media platforms, use the hashtag SOTCCS22. And of course, you can tweet at Raleigh Chamber with any feedback, comments, or anything that stands out. So hashtag SOTCCS22. I tweeted something out today, um, so you could grab the hashtag really quickly if you wanted to. So, uh, Without further ado, let's get started. Our first conversation today begins with Mayor Baldwin on the state of Raleigh. I just want to give you a little background. I know many people here are very familiar uh, with the mayor's background. She has actually lived in Raleigh for more than 30 years. One of the things I personally find fabulous is her two dogs. Every time I go to an event, she has them. Their name's Jack Bauer, which is the greatest name ever, and uh, Charlie Brown. I just want to get some of those fun facts out of the way uh, first. But as a as a 30 plus year resident of Raleigh and uh, a big commitment to uh, professional and public service here, she was a five time at large Raleigh City Councilor and elected mayor in 2019. Uh, she's also an advocate for innovation and entrepreneurship, affordable housing, homelessness and transit, which I'm sure she's gonna talk a lot about that today. Uh, she also has a background in fundraising and she previously worked with the Holt Brothers Foundation, as you know, uh, which supports children who have a parent with cancer. She's also the co-founder of two nonprofits, has seven grandchildren, and remains very, very busy, and uh, is our mayor. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Marianne Baldwin today. And Charlie Brown is just like Charlie Brown. He's a big goofball. So that's my words of wisdom for all of you today. Um, one, of, one of my friends named their dog Cash. That was a really bad idea because that dog has cost her more money than anything. So just, just say. So first off, 
I am so excited to be here today. It was interesting, when we met a, um, a year ago, we thought that we were coming out of COVID. So exciting to see everybody, and we weren't. And then I start my day reading the paper about this new variant. And, you know, we'll continue to work with our Wake County public health officials, but I'll tell you what, I just want to say we have accomplished more despite COVID, despite the challenges we have faced, and I'm going to share that with you. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge some of my um, city council colleagues who are here today. Um, Corey Branch, wave Corey, um, Stormy Ford. Is Patrick Bufkin here? Hey. Um, and I want to acknowledge our city manager, Marshall Adams David, and um, assistant city manager, Evan Raleigh. Thank you so much for being here. So I want to thank all of them for the progress that we've made. And I'm going to start first with housing affordability and choice. Um, I think we can all agree that stable housing is key to everybody's future. It's key to ending poverty. It's key to ensuring that we have equity um, in our city. We have passed a historic $80 million housing bond, never been done before, um, that's really helping us move forward in this regard. We have a goal of building 57 affordable housing units by 2026. And guess what? We're at 3,910 so far. So we're gonna hit that goal, being very aggressive. We've also committed $4 million in funds along with the county, our partners, because we can't do this alone. We have to do it together. This is going to be used to um, purchase and preserve an additional 4,500 um, units um, in the community. I also want to mention that it ju isn't just about building. We have changed our zoning codes to allow for missing middle housing. That's townhomes, duplexes, and other types of housing, cottage courts, um, not everybody needs or wants and certainly can't afford a 3,500 square foot home, but they might be able to afford an 800 or 1,200 square foot home. So the zoning code has been changed to allow for smaller units on shared land, shared backyards. We also um, are, are looking at eliminate, well, we have eliminated parking minimums. We are looking at um, tiny homes, we now allow that, something that I worked on for five years when I was on the council and couldn't get anywhere with it. So I'm really happy to see that we're making progress. I also want to talk about some of the partnerships we have and how we've used bond money. Um, there's an organization, a nonprofit called Healing Transitions. They're amazing. They work with com community members who are facing addiction. When I went to visit them, they had men sleeping on the floor because they didn't have enough room. We've committed $3 million to their expansion at, at Dix Park, which will help them serve more people. We've also committed $7 million to CASA. They're building a 100-unit community right near um, New Bern Avenue. So that means people will also have access to housing. And this is supportive housing. That means people get the services they need to help stabilize them, and that is key to success. And with funding from Opera, we also bought a hotel. And so this helped in two ways. It allowed us to keep people there so they weren't displaced, and will allow us to build um, supportive housing. CASA is our partner on that as well, and they will be providing the services. Transportation and transit. You know, every time, I, I think I've been working on this for 20 years now. And our county commission chair is laughing because he's been in it with me this whole time. Every time we think we are gonna make progress on commuter rail, something happens. Right now, prices are escalating, but I'm telling you right now, we have to get this done. If we don't get it done, we're gonna end up like Austin, Nashville, Seattle, places that have 
two hour commutes. Do you want your employees commuting two hours in the morning? Hell no. Furthermore, they won't do it. So that is going to be a detriment to our RTP companies. It will be a detriment to many companies who want to get the best talent possible. We need to make a commuter rail happen. And after talking about bus rapid transit for years, here's some good news. We are starting construction this fall on our first bus rapid transit line on New Bern Avenue. A lot of, yes. A lot of work has gone into that. It's so important, though, to our future. We're all go, also working on um, putting in for financing applications for the Southern BRT line, which is Wilmington Street, and we're working on um, Western Boulevard, which will connect us to our neighbors in Cary. So we're very thankful for that. All right, this is not a topic I thought I was ever going to have to say is one of our biggest challenges, but it is, and that's gun violence. Probably heard a lot this week. Our chief did a um, press conference on Tuesday to announce a new partnership with the U.S. Attorney's Office. We've already made 27 arrests for people with um, on drug charges and also gun charges. And we're getting serious. When you get the feds involved, that sends a message. We also are starting an interceptor program with the NAACP and Moms Demand Action. We put $1 million in funding toward this. The whole goal is to use um, intelligence-led policing to help us, in other words, data to help us identify higher crime areas and who will be more likely to commit a crime. It will also help us to get mental health services to those in need. So that's a really important effort. We're also working, we just had a call, I think I saw Bo Mills here. Thank you for setting up that call with the governor's office and state um, department of um, public safety. We are going to be working with them on an education program. Get this, we've had 563 guns that we've intercepted from people during traffic stops, crimes, whatnot. We've also had 200 guns reported stolen from cars. Let that sink in. Most of these cars are unlocked. People are leaving their, I want to say, damn guns under, in their car where anybody can access them. We are working on an education program, and quite frankly, if you own a gun, I am begging everybody in this city to be a responsible gun owner. Lock it in a safe, keep it away from your kids, keep it away from others, because also 75% of suicides, kids get the gun from the place where they live. That's intolerable. Another program that I advocated for was our ACORNS unit. This is a group of police officers and social workers. They respond to situations with a care first, enforcement last attitude. They have um, assisted 450 people since they were formed, and we're going to be expanding that unit this year. So I've talked about challenges. Let's talk about some good news, and that's economic development. We have a lot going on. NES Automotive they're going to locate their U.S. headquarters in Raleigh. Spot it. Um, this is a cybersecurity firm. They've selected Centennial Campus at NC State for their first U.S. location. In Telerad Medical Systems, they're making their new U.S. headquarters in Raleigh as well. And I was also really tickled to um, attend Gilead Sciences Business Services Unit, um, their ribbon cutting. 300 employees, 
the most diverse workforce I have ever seen. And that makes me thrilled to see the type of companies that we are attracting to this area. I also love um, companies who have started here and grown here. Um, on your way here, you might have seen the big pink pendo sign on top of 301 Hillsborough Street. Their new global headquarters opened several months ago. We have Bandwidth, who started on Centennial Campus. They are going to be, um, they're building their new global headquarters right now off of Edwards Mill Road. Another big win for our community. And companies like McAdams, um, long-term engineering firm based in Durham, is now moving its headquarters to, um, to Raleigh. So we, we welcome people who stay here and want to grow here and see their future here. So one other thing I want to mention, actually there's two. We are going to launch tomorrow, this is for our small business community, Oak City Biz Labs. We're partnering with the Carolina Small Business Development Fund and we've set aside $5 million in ARPA funding to, for grants and education and technical assistance for our small business community. The program launches tomorrow. Please spread the word among our small businesses this is really an opportunity for us to help them grow, learn, and get better at what they do. So, big news. Um, and then, the grand finale. We made the decision, put on the ballot, a $275 million parks and greenway bond this fall. This is also unprecedented. We've never put this kind of uh, bond on the ballot before. But the need is so great. We're going to jumpstart Dix Park, our central park, with um, $75 million in funding for the Gibson Play Plaza. This is gonna be one of those places that you can't really imagine until you see it, but you're gonna to wanna to bring your kids, your <laughs> grandkids, whoever comes to Raleigh, you're gonna to wanna to bring them there for this experience. We are also investing in Southeast Raleigh, $100 million for phase two of Chavis Park, and also um, for Tarboro Road. These are areas where we have underinvested in years, and this demonstrates our commitment to equity in our city and building better. And I've got one minute, so I'm gonna leave, leave with this. We need you to go out and vote on November 8th for the bond. We need you to move Raleigh forward, and we need you to work with us to ensure that we're not only building a city for today, but we're building a city for tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mayor Baldwin, for that. It's now my pleasure to introduce Wake County Commission Chair Sig Hutchinson to come up. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Chair Hutchinson. He's served on the Board of Commissioners since 2014. As a Wake County Commissioner, he's been an advocate for continuing to grow and better our parks and greenways, and has successfully led seven bond referendums totaling more than $400 million in Wake County and the City of Raleigh for open space, preservation, parks, greenways, transportation, and affordable housing. And he has leadership roles on numerous regional and state boards and associations. And sadly, I'm not sure if he has dogs that I need to give you the names of, but he can uh, maybe tell us that. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Wake County Commission Chair, Sig Hutchinson.
Good afternoon. Oh my. Uh, Amber, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Let me give a shout out to my Wake County Commissioner. If y'all could all stand so we can recognize you and we can see these folks. We've got Commissioner Matt Calabria, Dickie Adamson, Maria Savani, Dr. West, Dr. Thomas. We are going to have so much fun today. And I am so excited to be here. Thank you for being here. Um, how many of you love living in Raleigh and Wake County? See those hands? It's true, right? It's great. Well, the message I have for you is not only is this a great place to live, but it's a great place. Let me explain. Tom Earnhardt, exploring North Carolina, PBS, would say of temperate climates, North Carolina is the greatest, has the greatest biodiversity on the planet today. We have more species of frogs, salamanders, amphibians, freshwater mussels right here in Wake County on the planet. Hardwoods to the north, pines to the south meet right here in, Wake, in North Carolina, Wake County. Hemlocks from Maine, palmettos from Florida all make their home right here. Many of you know the reason. We have over 50 inches of rain a year. We also have 40 peaks in North Carolina, over 6,000 feet, by far the most on the entire East Coast. But there's something that you're not aware of, and that is what really helps so much on our biodiversity is 25,000 years ago was the last ice age. And over a series of these ice ages, the glaciers stopped at the Virginia line. Above Virginia, a cube of ice. Below Virginia, our biodiversity was saved. So if you're wondering why your intuition is, your intuition speaks to how much you love this place, it's true. It is the most beautiful place on the earth. But it's so much more than just the place. It's also Wake County, we have the most talented, educated, entrepreneurial, and leaders in the country. And it didn't happen by chance. In the 1920s, we were struggling like every other southern state in the country. But because of heroes like Terry Sanford, Jim Hunt, Bill Friday, who realized the power of education and started investing in educating our people, that created the best university system in the envy of the world. Right, Kevin? Absolutely. But not just our seven four-year institutions. We also have the best community college system in the country today. Right, Matt? Can we get a shout out to Wake Tech? I mean, I mean, 70,000 students whose lives are changed every year. I love to say, if you can dream it, you can become at Wake Tech. And let's not forget our K-12 public school system. And Lindsay will be speaking to us a little bit later on this, this afternoon. Other cities, you have to be able to pay to afford great public education or great education through private schools. Not here. Nationally recognized award-winning public schools right here in Wake County. And here's something you may not know. Smart Start, you all heard of Smart Start? High-end preschool, you know what I'm talking about? Started right here in Wake County right here and because we understand in Wake County some of the best investments we can make is in early childhood education. So much that our commissioners spent millions of dollars so thousands of our kids who want to can now go to high-end preschool Smart Start. In fact, it was so successful that Commissioner Matt Calabria brought it down to our three-year-olds. So now we have Wake preschool, so even three-year-olds can start high-quality preschool. Well, what have we done with all this talent? Well, just take a look. I mean, we won every damn award on the planet, including this month, okay? And we're still winning awards. We're the third fastest growing county in the country today, 62 people a day still coming and making Wake County their home. And because of all that growth and talent and leadership, it requires Wake County government to also be the best run county in America today, and we are. We have the most talented, innovative, and creative leaders that I've ever had the chance to work with. Seven years ago, we raised the minimum wage for all Wake County employees to a living wage, now over $18 an hour. We reduced poverty 
and strengthen our food security programs so that no family, no child, no child will have to go hungry. And we invested millions in affordable housing and transportation options. Oh, and along the way, we invested uh, millions of dollars to preserve a, a thousand acres of open space in the last two years alone. And oh, we had to deal with a thing called the uh, pandemic. COVID-19, and I believe that we handled it in Wake County better than any country, of any county in the country today. You know, uh, from our free testing, what you don't know is that we, we had over 1.6 million tests given to our citizens and over 300,000 vaccines to save lives. We had over 4,500 great heroes in Wake County making your lives better every day. But in the time I have left, I want to focus on four areas. Public health, behavioral health, housing, and economic development. Because these folks are not just professionals. They're not just heroes. Friends, they're superheroes. <laughs> superheroes are using their innovative ideas to solve big problems and make Wake County the best place to live in Tomorrowland. Superheroes like Dr. Jose Cabanas, Chief Medical Officer and superhero of the EMS team. Did you know that Wake County is the best place in the country to have heart attack and survive? <laughs> Good fun fact. Because of our superhero team that decided that was going to be their goal. So they trained and worked with our hospitals. And last year alone, they saved 113 people we're talking flatline. We're talking dead and brought back to life. And we have a celebration every year that I love to go to. It's my favorite celebration where all these people come back and the stories you hear. Fathers who are able to walk their daughters down the aisle. Mothers who are going to be able to go to their son's graduation. And grandparents who get to show up for their grandbaby's first birthday. I mean, if that didn't bring a tear to your eye, you just ain't human. You know what I'm saying? 113 people are alive today because of our superheroes. And just imagine during the height of the pandemic, these, these heroes were manning their Batmobiles and heading out even before the vaccines to make sure that we were taking care of our Wake County citizens in need to the point now that our emergency calls are overwhelming. We have over 10,000 calls a month. To 911. So what do we have to do? We needed a plan. So our superheroes came up with an innovative plan called the Nurse Navigation Program. Now get this. Okay. When a call comes in, we now triage it. So if it's not life-threatening, we hand you off to a licensed nurse who can then deal with your situation with a better outcome, faster and less expensive. And in fact, one of the persons who called into our nurse ended up going to the nurse navigation pro program. She, uh, she commented, man, you're better than my doctor. This is great. I'm going call 9-1 again. <laughs> Next year, we're going to divert over 6,500 calls with ultimately better outcomes. But one point, at one point, we needed new superheroes. So we stepped up, Wake County. First thing we did, we said we needed to pay them, and we did. And now we have better pay than anywhere else in the region. And that means that we are attracting top talent. We also needed a superhero institution. So we reached out to Wake Tech. And we used our Wake Apprentice program so that we could attract EMS folks with the opportunity to get free tuition, free books, and a stipend, a stipend while they're learning. The results, amazing. 62 new recruits have signed up, the biggest class ever, ready to learn, suit up, and then answer the call. Our second group of superheroes came from our unprecedented need around behavioral health, anxiety, depression, opioid addiction, in large part because of the pandemic, or in part because of the pandemic. Fortunately, to answer the call, we had no other, no other than that woman herself, Denise Foreman assistant to the manager, and her faithful companion, Robin, or better known to us mortals as Kevin Fitzgerald. 
Along with her, these superheroes, we had a team known as the Clinical Scholars, five medical providers, backed by none other than the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the number one foundation, medical foundation in the world today, who backed these superheroes with $500,000 to create a nationally recognized program of improving outcomes for vulnerable populations and homelessness that called the Familiar Faces Health Collaborative. It uses an integrated approach to housing, health care, addiction, and mental health disorders, and more. Their task was daunting, and yet these superheroes coming from Wake Med, UNC Rex, Duke Health and Wake County came together to solve such intergalactical problems as healthcare privacy or HIPAA, data sharing, holistic case management, supportive housing, all using a new space age technology. Oh yes, my friends, lesser counties would shrink in terror over the thought of these context, complex problems of three hospitals, six county departments, and dozens of partners but with their super strength, they organized these partners and started to scale up for solutions. But the rest of the story, the rest of the story is is saving us, the taxpayers, millions of dollars by reducing EMS calls, emergency room visits, jail time and homelessness. Compassionate, but also very cost effective. But wait, there's more. Sadly, depression, anxiety, suicide tips are at an all-time half all-time high with our youth. Step in the school-based mental health superhero team. A partnership with Alliance Health, these superheroes are working with teachers, classroom aides, administrators, parents to identify kids who are suffering from serious mental health crises and connecting them up to services while there's still time. The result for these families and kids, once again, life-changing. Next stop is Wonder Woman herself, our Director of Affordable Housing, Lorena McDowell and her team of housing superheroes. This gargantuan effort to address affordable housing started in earnest in 2019 when my fellow commissioners and I allocated one cent or $15 million to address affordable housing. We're now with $40 million of Wake County funds. These Wonder workers have leveraged these dollars 12 to 1 with outside funding to create $400 million to answer the call of affordable housing. With a mix of rental assistance, single family housing, supportive housing, as well as working to keep folks in their existing housing, this team worked on a multitude of issues from housing the homeless to, to helping teachers, police, and fire achieve the American dream of home ownership. Right, Janet? <laughs> the goal back in 2019 was creating 2,500 units in five years, but this wonder staff knocked it out in three. During COVID, most of you are not aware of this, we mostly had to shut down to socially distance our homeless shelters. So our superheroes, along with the help of Alice Lutz, Alice, raise your hand, Prime Family Services, and a host of community partners took over two hotels. Okay, now the hotels are mostly empty. So the staff stayed, and they just treated the homeless folks as guests, as they were, right? And I'm telling you, it was wild, right, Alice? Oh yeah, it was wild. But we brought in health healthcare workers, mental health workers. They had AA and NA classes, anger management classes, three meals a day, and more. And, and it was not easy. Alice has got a few more gray hairs, right, Alice? But the outcome was we permanently housed 300 people from that experience who are homeless who are now housed. And when I toured the hotel and I asked the folks who were working, I said, what do you think of this? Without exception, everyone had the same answer. I love it. I love it because I'm helping people. Because that's the wake way. Another he housing heroes innovation has been our new Bridge to Home program where we're investing $10 million in our partners to give homeless residents the services that they need to keep them in safe, stable, and quick, and to house them as quickly as possible. We're just getting started. You can see the eight partners on the screen that we've already funded have that money, so stay tuned on that. All right, our final superhero. Final superhero is actually in the room this afternoon. The leader of Wake Economic Development Team, his mortal name is Michael Haley. Michael? But for those of you who know him well, 
It's only Captain America. <laughs> the captain and his team of superheroes have been landing galactical sized super deals right and left here in Wake County. Now, we all know they have a great team, and they always have a great story to tell our diversity, our vibrant economy, our great quality of life, and our skilled and available workforce. But the captain and his team has been showing off their super skills by landing the most innovative companies in the world today. Right, Michael? Absolutely. Apple, Amgen, Fuji, Dyson Biotechnologies. And we have got bigger deals that I'd love to tell you about. But Michael would kill me. So I can't do that. But we all know economic growth is a lifeblood of keeping our community going. And the captain and his team of superheroes are keeping that blood flowing through our veins. So thank you, Captain America, and your team. Let's give it up for the captain, right? All right, Wake County. We've talked about a lot today. We've talked about biodiversity. We've talked about education. We've also talked about public health, behavioral health, housing, and economic development, as well as the best web, best run county in America because of our superheroes. But we've saved the best to last. Because now it's time to talk about you. Because we know inside each one of you there's a superhero waiting to come out. To realize your dreams, to find your passion, to live into your full potential, and to make a real difference in the community. With your kids, your spouse, your church or synagogue, civic group or nonprofit. How many of you would like to live into the superhero that you truly are today, right now? How many of you can I see those hands? Absolutely. All right. It's this two-step process to realize the superhero to you, to be anointed the superhero that you are today. First thing, you must all, okay, we, we got to remember, Wonder Woman, she had her lasso of truth. Bruce Wayne had his bat suit. But what you need, what you need to realize your superhero-ness is a superhero mask. So, step one, I'm asking everyone to stand up right now. You'll see mask in the middle of your table. Superheroes, if you could, please, don your mask. Don your mask right now before we move on to the second step of your superhero-ness. All right, if you are ready for the challenge, Put on your mask, Wake County, because you are about to be realized as the superhero that you are. All right. Now, the second thing, superheroes, to become a truly superhero, you must recite the superhero creed, which goes like this. Arise, Wake County, it's time to fly. Good. Now, it has to be done in unison, all right, on the count of three. Are you ready, Wake County? Are you ready, Wake County? Oh, wait a minute. Mine? Oh, my God. Okay, all right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, I have to tell you, for this to take place, the creed has to be given by a superhero in their superhero outfit. Do we have anyone? We need a superhero in a superhero outfit. Anyone? Could it be me?
All right, no one, uh, no one here expected that. Sig, if only you'd come out of your shell a little bit more. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. You'll stop being so shy. Thank you so much, Chair Hutchinson. We appreciate that. And now that we are all superheroes, we didn't know it was such a transforming day. My pleasure now to introduce our final speaker, Wake County School Board Chair, Lindsay Mahaffey. You have to follow that. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Lindsay. She grew up near Buffalo, New York, received her BA in International Studies in French from St. John Fisher College, and she, this is cool, she spent a year teaching English as a second language in the French public school system in France before moving to Seattle, Washington, where she taught K-8 French, Spanish, social studies, and middle school advisory. She has a Master's of Arts in Teaching and Social Science Education, and she earned that between working and raising three daughters, two of whom currently attend Wake County Public Schools. As an educator, Lindsay strongly believes in whole child education, so please join me in welcoming Wake County Public School System <laughs> Board Chair and Superhero, Lindsay Mahaffey. You know it's time to update your bio when your oldest two are in middle school and your youngest is entering third grade. Um, thank you, Amber, very much. And I just want everyone to know that I have no props and um, I will be wearing this outfit the entire time. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to everyone. And I want to start by introducing my fellow colleagues on the Wake County Board of Education um, and our superintendent who are here today. Can you please stand up so I know who's here? Um, we have the wonderful Roxy Cash, Heather Scott, our superintendent, Kathy Moore, Miss Monika Johnson Hostler. Over here we have Christine Kushner and our Vice Chair, Chris Haggerty. Thank you all for all of your help and work. I think there are only eight other people in this room who know um, what we're dealing with at the school board level, and I can't think of a better team. On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, and it is clear from your participation that you are committed to our students their families, our teachers and employees in the Wake County Public School System, and for that I am grateful. The theme we're adopting this year in our schools is from here anything is possible. And after the last couple of years going through a pandemic, everything does indeed seem possible. But let's start by stating the obvious. Absolutely none of this would be possible without our nearly 20,000 staff members. And if you're keeping score, we are Wake County's third largest employer. Our staff shows up every day at our 198 schools with one single goal, to graduate our students ready for productive citizenship as well as higher education or a career. More than 11,000 of these employees are teachers on the front lines in the classroom, challenging and engaging students in relevant, rigorous, and meaningful learning each and every day. To put that huge responsibility into perspective, today the Wake County Public School System is the 15th largest school district in the nation, serving around 160,000 students. We are responsible for preparing more than 75% of this community's children to reach their full potential and lead productive lives in this complex and changing world. We take that responsibility very seriously. If you had the privilege of attending one of our 31 high school graduation ceremonies this year, you know that we are the best at what we do. Our 11,000 graduates this year earned over $140 million in scholarship money to support their goals in higher education. We have numerous students who are moving into every branch of the military. And many have been trained in careers in areas such as information technology, engineering, health sciences, 
medical bioscience, agribusiness, environmental fields, digital media, creative design, and finance, just to name a few. And they are entering skilled trade professions. And as Dr. Rawls well knows, many of our students even graduate with an associate's degree through our valuable partnership with Wake Tech and other area colleges and universities. We are extremely proud of the excellent public education system that we have built here in Wake County. We enjoy a great deal of success, including schools and individuals who have been recognized statewide and nationally. And I want to take a couple minutes to highlight just a few of those successes. For 16 consecutive years, Wake County has led the nation in the number of educators earning their national board certification. That is the gold standard in teaching. About half of our teachers hold master's degrees and some even hold doctoral degrees. 45 of our magnet schools were awarded national recognition as schools of excellence and schools of distinction. Six of our schools received the Purple Star Award for support of our military families. Three of our high schools, Wake Stem, Panther Creek, and Green Hope, are ranked in the top 1,000 of high schools in the nation. Our superintendent, Kathy Moore, was named National Superintendent of the Year by Magnet Schools of America. And her leadership has earned her a finalist position for North Carolina's Superintendent of the Year. This year, one of our teachers, Ms. Victoria Lightfoot, Foote, who's now at Millbrook Magnet Elementary School, was awarded the prestigious Milken Educator Award, and our students' achievements are too numerous to count. According to published data, they regularly outperform their counterparts on SAT scores, and they score higher than the national average on AP exams. But most importantly, we are proud of our graduation rate. Our graduation rate is our number one key performance indicator. And here's why. When a student graduates, they're more likely to be employed. They earn a higher income, they're healthier, and they support our community's economic development. As we have discussed countless times, a skilled workforce is the key to a successful economy and a successful community. So we are proud to report that we graduate over 90% of our students which is up from 80% in 2018. And that is a number that is higher than the national average, although much of what I'm sharing today isn't news to you. You all know our highly rated school system is one of the many reasons so many employers and employees are moving to this area. They come here seeking a good quality of life for their employees or their families and a highly qualified pool of talent. And we want you to know we take the responsibility of ensuring our students are prepared for these jobs very seriously. Several years ago, many of you contributed to our strategic plan. Your input informed the following mission statement. The Wake County Public School System will provide a relevant and engaging education and will graduate students who are collaborative, creative, effective communicators, and critical thinkers. Business leaders shared these skills, which we fondly call the four C's, and let us know that these are essential for their employees to be successful in the workplace. We are in the middle of refining our strategic plan but these essential skills remain at the center of our strategy, along with some new focus areas that were expressed as top priorities by members of our community. We will remain engaged on excellence in reading, mathematics, science, and social studies, digital knowledge, and financial literacy, and we'll focus on behavioral health. 
skills such as empathy, respect, and work ethic. During the last two years of this pandemic, with the community support, we have persevered. Now, we're looking ahead and building on our success. This fall, in partnership with the Chamber, the county, and local agencies, we will be sharing information about our upcoming school building program. Funding for this program is expected to come from county funds and bonds, which will be on the November 8th ballot for our community to consider. Our children deserve the most effective learning environments possible. Well, we don't have the pressure of growth that we've had historically, although after yesterday's news, more people are learning the secret and it is out, and that is not a bad thing. But many of our schools were built more than 30 years ago during a boom period, and these schools are showing their age and require significant renovations. The upcoming building program will focus mainly on renovations so that all students in the community can grow and flourish in an effective learning environment. We have an obligation to maintain our 198 schools, which totals more than 27 million square feet in building space. This is so our students have safe spaces in which to learn. Major renovations include everything from large HVAC system replacements to entirely rebuilding the schools. Remember, we operate schools year round. They started on July 7th, and there are 36 year round schools that have already begun. So having air conditioning working in the summer is very important. We also need to continue to promote school safety. At the beginning of the pandemic, we took steps to enhance our safety measures. We had an independent security assessment come and check on every one of our schools. This initiative was a proactive step in our continual assessment to enhance our safety procedures, resources, and measures. And in reviewing those findings, the security auditors were positive about the state of school security in Wake County. They shared some areas in which we need improvement, which we've already begun working on. We're committed to making those improvements, working collaboratively to prioritize our needs. But recent events, like the tragic shooting in Uvalde, Texas, have strengthened our resolve to ensure that children in our community remain safe and protected. And to this regard, I extend my sincerest gratitude to our Sheriff's Office, Raleigh PD, and local law enforcement agencies, as well as our own Wake County Public School System security team, for their planning and preparedness, and all of the steps they take to ensure our still children's safety, and we hope that the unimaginable never happens here. Thank you. We have spent a lot of time discussing what makes Wake great, but that doesn't mean we aren't without our challenges. Next month, we'll kick off another school year for our traditional calendar schools, and we'll start the year off with a reminder that our students and our staff are resilient. With the help of pandemic relief funds from the county, the district was able to provide Chromebooks to all of our students, and we're proud to say we are a one-to-one -one device district, which means every student has a personal computer to use for their learning. And with the help of our community, students are, have persevered through the pandemic. And while many have adapted well, some even thrived, Despite the tremendous challenges of the past few years, we have to acknowledge that many are still working on academic recovery today. We're very thankful for our recently announced partnership with the YMCA and the A.J. Fletcher Foundation to have a tutoring program in many of our schools to help with that recovery. Standardized test results show improvement this year, but there are still many students who need additional support and our philosophy will continue to meet students where they are and provide them with individual with instruction and support that they need to be successful. This support will be needed both inside and outside of the classroom and it includes behavioral health services, supporting not just the academic but also the social emotional well-being remains a top priority and to this end together with the county we have increased the number of counselors, social workers, school psychologists in our schools. We are committed to this joint multi-year plan to achieve nationally recommended ratios for these positions that are so vital in educating the whole child. And just like many of you, we have seen serious labor shortages. 
namely among our support staff, such as bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and instructional assistants. So we're proud that in partnership with the county, this year's budget increases, the starting salary for all non-certified employees is a minimum of $16 an hour. We're hopeful that this is another step in ensuring that Wake County Public Schools is the best choice for students and the best choice for our employees. In order to be the best school district, we have to have the best talent. And like many of you, that means a focus on staff, recruitment, and retention. Our community is not unique in these challenges, and many communities are facing similar struggles. But what all the magazines say is true, we are the best place to live in America. And while the food and the weather are great, that's not what makes us the best. What makes us the best is people in this community who care about the success and well-being of every part of our population, including the smallest of us, our precious children. So, on behalf of our students, I want to end on a note of gratitude. Our community has long recognized the critical need for a strong public school system if we want to excel academically and economically. The investment in our students and those who care for them is what makes Wake County a desirable place for many families, including my own. So if you're a student listening today, thank you for your hard work and your dedication in your pursuit of learning. If you're a teacher or a staff member, my deepest gratitude for dedicating your life to the service of children. And if you are a parent, I wanna thank you for partnering with us and entrusting us with the education of your child. Mayor Baldwin, fellow city and municipal leaders, I wanna thank you for your shared commitment to excellence in public education. To Chair Hutchinson and our county commissioners, Thank you for demonstrating time and again the shared belief that a community thrives and benefits from investing in a strong public school system. And to everyone here, business leaders, community leaders, and members, my sincerest and humblest thanks. We are extraordinarily grateful for your continued support. The simple fact is we can't do this alone. With your support, your strategic minds, and your oversight, I'm sure we can continue to serve the community and be a national example of excellence in public education. Your strong support reflects our shared commitment. Investing in education allows every child to thrive and meet their full potential, ultimately becoming and to becoming productive and contributing citizens with a sense of self-fulfillment. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McAfee. So at this time, I'm going to invite all three of our speakers uh, up to the stage here. We're going to begin shortly our Q&A session. So I just want to remind you, um, we do welcome questions from the audience. Um, if you have any questions, all you have to do is put your hand pretty high in the air. And Andrew, where are you, Andrew? Right here, he's going to come up uh, and, and allow you to ask your questions. Um, so we certainly are, are, are grateful for all of, the, all of the, the work that everyone does and the dedication of all the important issues that uh, our panel has covered today. So growth has been a very big theme. I think that's going to kick it off. I'll let them get situated uh, before, we, before we get going. And I want to remind you that if you um, do send out any social media, the hashtag again is SOTCCS. 22, uh, if you could just tag that hashtag or Raleigh Chamber, they would love to get your feedback or any thoughts uh, on our event today. And we will get you out of here right at 1.30 today. We appreciate your time and we know it's very valuable. So I'm gonna have a seat. I think everyone's, all right, we're all good to go. Um, Sig, you talked about, did you say 66 people a day are moving into Wake County? Was that the number? 62. 62. So growth is a huge issue um, in, in our region. Can you talk about the, what, what the biggest concern is with that growth um, looking ahead to the future? We know uh, that Mayor Baldwin talks a lot about the need for public transit. Uh, is that 
something that you see or what, what do you see as the biggest challenge with those numbers? Well, thank you. Let me just, let's frame this in a positive way, okay? That 62 people coming here today is a great story and it sure beats the alternative, okay, right? We do not want to be shrinking. And this success, we want to keep the welcome light on, particularly the business leaders here, because you know, Michael Haley, what it means to have that type of economic growth, but it creates challenges, and that's what we have to realize, is these are just challenges, but look, we're up for the challenge, we're leaders. You know, we have to deal with affordable housing, we have to deal with transit and transportation options, you know, we have to support our education system, and we have to create healthy communities. So all of this creates a vibrant opportunity where, where, where we want all of our people to thrive, because we all live better when we all live better. Mayor, did you want to chime in on that as well? Because I know I know Raleigh is is one of the main areas, and maybe maybe you all can comment too on what are do you know what the largest areas of growth are surrounding uh, around the county? I'm sorry, but I keep looking at Sig, and I just start laughing. Um, <laughs> I did post a video of him, like yes, but so it's out there on Twitter for all of you to relive this moment, but. Um, you know, on a serious note, like when we did our comp plan, we identified areas of growth where that was going to happen. And so obviously downtown, midtown, um, areas of Briar Creek, and then look what's happening in Southeast Raleigh. I mean, a amazing growth there. Um, also, as 540 gets built out, you're seeing more and more people coming to us in, from the ETJ. And that's something we're studying with the county as well. But what we have tried to do is build bus rapid transit system around those areas of, so New Bern Avenue, our most heavily used um, transit line. Um, we're looking next at Wilmington Street, which will go to downtown south. Then from um, downtown to Western Boulevard to Cary. And finally, Capitol Boulevard. And I think what we're going to see at Cap on Capitol Boulevard is a major transformation from these big box stores and parking lots and whatnot to um, the new way of living. And that is going to be a game changer for us. But um, to me, transit is the number one thing with, that we have to look at to deal with growth. As I alluded to earlier, we do not want two hour <laughs> No. Nobody wants to sit in their car for two hours either way, getting to and from work. That cannot happen here. And the way it doesn't happen is for all of us to be leaders. And I'm going to, I see Joe Malazzo out here. Um, Joe, Regional Transportation Alliance and the business community has to play a big role in that. So thank you for what you're doing. Lindsay, did you want to just give some thoughts on, on kind of managing the growth aspect, especially when it comes to the school system? Yeah, I think uh, one of the great things of seeing all of these companies come is you know they would not be here if they did not see the value in the education system because they want to grow their employees. They want to have a great education system for their employees' children, but they also want to be in a place where their future employees can just be homegrown. Um, what we are seeing, though, is for our staff, whether they're educators or support staff, is housing affordability is impacting that because when you have employees that are on government salaries, it's, you know, $16 an hour sounds like a wonderful living wage until you look at what rent is or what it costs to um, pay for a home. And so making sure that we're able to keep up rates and we're very lucky to have a, a high teacher supplement, we're very lucky to get to that $16 an hour. Um, but if we're looking at recruitment and retention of our workforce, we want them to be able to um, stay here. The other piece is just keeping up with growth, um, especially out in Western Wake County. We have schools that are capped. We have schools where um, that needs to be you know, shared and making sure that we can keep up with growth while land is also becoming less and less available in those high growth areas. So those are continual challenges that we've always had. It just seems like it's exacerbated now with this new um, 
group of folks that are choosing to come here and we certainly want to welcome them and make them a part of this community. We talk a lot about affordable housing, uh, living wages with especially, you know, our fire, our police. We hear from them. We know the firefighters especially um, were very vocal uh, as budgets were passed. Um, you pro all probably saw the viral video of the house that uh, had an open house and hundreds of people showed up and it was really about the price point of that house, right? It was right around, I think, 300, which seems to be a sweet spot for what, you know, for people looking uh, for home ownership. Right now, it, it, we talk about this a lot in our newsroom, this area is so different than the rest of the company because of the news of Apple coming, because of the growth, because of what is going on. How do you manage that? How do you get a cap on that? How do you get a handle on that and, and really start to get those numbers where they are a reality for people that can achieve home ownership and have a livable wage, as we were saying, to work in the city where you live and work where you, you know, are? I know, I know this is a big, big thing for you. So there's a number of things we can do, and we have been doing them. Our partnership with the county is tremendous, and when you work together, you actually, I mean, can really make things happen. So one of the things we can do is land that we own, so land that the city owns, land that the county owns, land that the schools own, that are not going towards schools. Let's look at how we could use those to create affordable communities. I'll give an example. Um, if you have an elementary school and there's extra land, what if you build housing there for seniors? All of a sudden you have an entire group of volunteers that can walk across the street and be part of your school system. I mean, what if we um, create communities near a school and then we don't have to bus students? and their parents can go right across the street to school. It puts them closer, creates a better connection. We are, um, own land at Moore Square. We have put out an RFI um, and have gotten responses back. We asked people, we weren't prescriptive, but we said, bring us your best ideas and tell us how we can include affordable housing here. So waiting to see what people come back with. But that's one area, and when we control the land, we have a say in what can be built there. The other thing is with our housing bond, we have money set aside to purchase land for land banking, so on transit corridors. First off, if you can build affordable housing near a transit corridor, you've solved two problems. You've made it more affordable, but also that person doesn't have to spend $10,000 a year on car expenses and God knows what it costs now with gas. So, it, you know, we're looking at those types of things, but land, as Lindsay said, that's the big factor right now. How do we purchase that land? How do we get control of that land? And then how do we have a say on how it's developed? Sure, thank you, Amber. And I'd, I'd offer uh, three things. First, uh, on a positive note, you know, yes, inflation is, serious and yes we haven't seen this rise in housing prices in, in our lifetimes but compared to our competitors around the country our housing prices are still reasonable so we have to remember that uh, and but we need to do a lot so that's the first thing though the second thing i would offer and this this is an important discussion when we think about the social determinants of health the determinants the t determinants that in, that ensure your health and your well-being and your happiness the two number one, the two things that are first and second are housing and transportation. The mayor's talked about transit and the significance of transit, but let's let's say that if we could tie housing and transportation together, so along BRT corridors or along commuter rail corridors, if you start concentrating housing so that you don't have to own a car, because cars are just filthy expensive. You know, a typical a car can cost you six to eight thousand dollars a year. Well, let's say you could do away with that cost. That's putting an extra four or five hundred dollars a month in your pocket. Or you could just do away with one car. You could just be a one car family. So from that standpoint, I think we have to think about this holistically, as well as if we can build schools along transit lines or 
jobs along transit lines. So all of a sudden we create walkable communities, healthy communities, uh, where people can move around and put more money in their pocket. So affordability needs to be looked at as the total picture. It's just not the cost of your house, it's how much money's in your checking account at the end of the month. You talked about inflation. The news just came out yesterday that it was 9.1%, the highest since 1981. And this, I think the stat we ran yesterday was this is hitting families, to put it in perspective, what you were paying this time last year for groceries is now almost $500 more. That's a lot of money. Um, Lindsay, I wanted to talk to you about how does the school system manage that? How do you manage this inflation going forward? Um, we know that so many students rely on school systems for free and reduced lunch. How do you manage um, the prices of that, the budgets of that? Because really this seems to just be such a fluid situation that we're going through this year. So if you could give some insight into how the projections and the planning go when we see these inflation numbers. Yeah, we um, unfortunately had to raise our lunch prices this year because of that. Um, and every family um, who qualifies for free and reduced lunch, we have to do a lot of outreach to make sure we get families to apply um, to get that qualification so that they can get free or reduced lunch. And that is a big lift um, for our school district every year. And we know there are folks that we miss. And so we have to continue because annually a family has to apply. So it's not once you get it, you're good. It's next year you have to do it again. Um, last year, having the um, federal government come in and, and cover the cost of school breakfast, school lunch, has, was incredible um, for so many of our families. And I would have loved to, you know, personally would have loved to have seen that continue. Um, we know that we've partnered with the Wake County Commissioners to have free breakfast in many of our schools. And um, we do have uh, community grants that we apply for. So some of our schools, if their free and reduced population is above a certain percentage, they you know, they get uh, free breakfast and free lunch through that programming. But certainly something, as we're looking at these costs um, for our students and making sure that they have access to healthy and nutritious meals, because if you're hungry, it's hard to learn. I just want to take a moment. Does anyone have any questions? If you do, I want to give you an opportunity as we continue our conversation here. You can throw your hand up. Some questions. OK, I'll let Andrew move his way around. James West, so Wake County Commissioner. First of all, I'd like to commend the presenters for the leadership that's being provided. We certainly are moving in a very positive way. I know uh, we developed a document called A Better Way County. It has um, really some real outcomes that could make uh, this county a much better place to live. But my question is, with the income and economic inequality that we have, um, and also the issue around housing and transit and having um, housing along transit lines right on down the line. Um, we need to come together in a collaborative, collective way, I feel, uh, as it relates to the issue of looking at things closer in an equity lens and have some measurements and metrics and timelines to work on those. Uh, we've made a lot of progress, but there is still a gap between the haves and the have-nots. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. West. Great comments. I do want to say, having lived in the Seattle area before coming to Wake County, I think being able to see the work that happens collaboratively with our municipal leaders, with our county leaders, with our business leaders, in order to get ahead of some of these problems, in order to, before this huge surge of growth, has been incredible to see um, because, you know, we, you hear about what's happening over there. It, it's that viral video happened daily um, in the Seattle area, and so I know the ch chamber trip to Seattle. I think was able to have some great conversations with folks to help address some of those issues that they were experiencing to get ahead. And let, and let me just give Dr. West a shout out. Can we give him a hand for 30 years of public service serving the most vulnerable in our communities? 
he has always been a champion of that. And, and so I want to speak to one thing that Dr. West is talking about, you know, social determinants, housing, transportation, but also health care. And I, Adrian, where are you? Adrian, listen, the best thing we can do for health care is expand Medicaid. We've got 50,000 citizens and residents here in Wake County who do not have health insurance right now that they could have health insurance if we expanded Medicaid. And so Adrian and the chamber stepped up and passed a resolution. We're going to get this done this year. But once again, Dr. West has been a huge champion of these folks, of vulnerable people who need this type of health care that could be provided by uh, expansion of Medicaid. Yep. Totally agree. Thank you to the chamber for your leadership. Uh, hi, I'm Jasmine Gallup with Indie Week. Uh, you guys have talked about the commuter rail. I'm just wondering, what have been the biggest roadblocks to that in the past, and what can be the plan moving forward? Um, I know that's a big question, but as we're you know still trying to get this done, it should be a priority. Uh, what what can uh, the city and the county do moving forward? Consensus and cost have been the challenges of the past. Cost is still a challenge for us right now. Um, that requires creativity. And um, our superhero over here, he now serves as, um, on the Go Triangle board and also is chair of Campo. That's two of our partners who we need to work with to move this forward. And SIG has devoted years of his life to making this happen. So the bottom line is, Jasmine, we have to get creative. We can't keep doing things the way we've been doing. We need help from the feds. We need help from the state. And we also need to have our own commitment to make sure, as leaders, that we are saying this is necessary. And we find ways to get it done. We can't just flinch and go, oh, this is hard. Everything's hard right now. We just have to find creative solutions, and that's what we're doing. And I'm so glad you raised that, because let me just, sh just stand on the, the mayor's shoulders here and talk about the transformational nature of commuter rail, okay? 37 miles of commuter rail, which goes through eight of our 10 job centers here in Wake County. The job centers, okay? But if you think about it, you know, the corridor goes through the job centers, but it's, a, it's an industrial corridor because it's been rail, it's been freight rail, so a half mile on each side of that is just warehouses. What if we turn that into affordable housing and then have buses that go up and down to take you to the centers, I mean, to the, uh, the, 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 the train stations? Two social determinants right there. It's transformational, and we can go to the airport, okay? It's transformational. We have to get commuter rail done. It's the spine of our whole system. We're going to figure this out. The main problem right now is just cost, like everything else. But, you know, Corey Branch is on the Go Triangle board. You know, he's here. Your, your folks, the mayor and I, are 100% supportive of commuter rail because it has to be done. We have to have transportation options to give people a choice to not only move around in a healthier way, but to be able to combine their housing and transportation to put more money in their pocket. Some more questions from the audience, Andrew. I know there were some, some, art, some hands up in the air. This side, it looks like. I, I also wanted to, Lindsay, you, you spoke about this just as Andrew's coming over there. Um, the news yesterday, uh, CNBC uh, found North Carolina is the best place for business. What, what follows that? Just from your, does your phone start ringing? What starts happening after that? Do businesses, I mean, what do we see? What does that do for, for the state, for, for the region when you, when you land on a list like that? I think Adrienne's phone didn't stop ringing yesterday. Yeah, that's a big, a big one. We currently have, I think, 61 active projects looking at this area. Um, and I will say, when Apple made the announcement that they were coming here, that put us on the map. Other people started looking at us. Well, yesterday's announcement, that just amped it up even more. I mean, all this is great news. Yep. But, you know, it's good news, great news for everybody here. But, you know, the mayor and city councils and town councils, we get a lot of pressure because a lot of folks show up at our city council, town council, and say, we don't want any more housing. We don't want that multifamily project in our development. And we've got to get over that, right? 
I mean, it's good news, but it's only good news if we keep up with the infrastructure and continue to build capacity in housing, continue to buy, build transportation options, continue to in, in, invest in our housing, uh, excuse me, in our education, and expand Medicaid. We have to continue to be the best because, you know, it's nice to be on top, but you can fall off quick, right? And to your point, too, it takes political will to get this done. And people are gonna be mad at you. They don't want townhouses in their neighborhood. I've heard people say, I don't want those people living there. I don't know who those people are, but those people are residents of our community, and they deserve a place to live. I, I'm at that point where I'm like, you know what? We have to be a welcoming community for all. A townhouse is a townhouse. It doesn't represent an evil. It represents a home for people. And we have to start getting over ourselves and saying, you know what? We're gonna be a community for everyone. And I need all of you, all of you, to start believing that, communicating that, and having it be part of our shared vision. And one last thing, if I could, and that is that we in government have a role to play in the affordable housing conversation, okay? Because we, and for all our electeds out there, because we're the ones who do the permitting and inspections. And if it takes three months to get a new house permitted or inspected, that's three months on the, um, the interest rate clock that that builder's having to pay, to pay, as well as he or she can't sell that house to build a new house until all of that's done. So we, we have to take a responsibility to make sure that permits and inspections are done as quickly as possible. Thank you, Steve Rao, the town of Morrisville. Uh, I, I guess my question for the panel is, I know a couple weeks ago, Mayor Baldwin attended, I was there, um, the Wake County Economic Development meeting on uh, transforming Raleigh into a, a headquarters community. So I'd be very curious, just for the audience, if you guys could just give us some ideas of what you think um, we need to be doing so we get more corporate headquarters coming in from around the country and around the world. Thank you. So the first thing I would say is we have to be intentional. These things don't happen by luck. They happen because you make it happen. So intentionality is really important. You know, I've had phone calls with people in Salt Lake um, sitting on some of these international panels, and they're asking me, how have you done this? And you know, we're one of the leaders in um, pharmaceuticals, life sciences, whatnot, like intentionality. So that's the number one step, being intentional and making it happen, having a vision and then living up to the vision. Yeah, and Steve, I'm so glad that you asked the question because the mayor is absolutely right. Many of you, you are not aware of what it means to have the, the, the national headquarters, international headquarters right here because with those CEOs and C-level suite, their, their money comes. You know, they start, don't they start investing in the community where they're headquartered. So that's why it's so important. And Adrian and Michael have set a goal. We want to attract, right Adrian? We, we want to attract headquarters. And another thing that we've done that is amazing is the site ready locations, like what Holly Springs has done with Amgen. You know, so municipalities have to get intentional about having site ready locations to be able to push out uh, for economic development. So site-ready locations and being intentional about headquarters is truly making the difference that we're having today. And having a strong education system so they can continue. Mm -hmm. Talent is key. I mean, if you don't have the workers in the workforce, you, you can be intentional, you can do all the things you want to do, you can throw money around, but the fact is, if you don't have the workforce, it ain't happening. Really, I know we're running out of time, but really quickly, if you wanted to come up and ask a question, you can. Uh, one of the things that you have not mentioned, which is the financial aspect of this, is
Well, first off, the county has programs in place to help people pay um, their taxes, like abatement process, um, especially seniors on fixed incomes and those who are disabled. And, you know, there's been a lot of communication about that, um, and that is key to that. You know, having rising property values isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's a bad thing for those who can't afford it. And I'm gonna put it on the other side too. As property values rise, that also means your wealth rises. So that means that you have the opportunity at some point when you're ready to sell your home to realize a much bigger investment than you would have otherwise anticipated. So there are positives and negatives, but there are things in place to help people, especially those who are most vulnerable in our community, um, get their tax bills taken care of. So you yeah. want to talk about that? Yeah, Anne, and, and Anne Franklin is a longtime advocate in the community. So Anne, two things I would say. Um, Number one, about good government, you know, we do have great government working together. And Adrian and Michael will tell you, you know, when companies come here, they want functional, um, predictable government that they can work with. We have everybody's, each other's cell phones. Uh, the mayor and I have been working together for 30 years. So we all work together and we get along together, both, you know, in Wake County and regionally. But, um, the other thing about taxes is, you may not know this, but Wake County has got we're in the bottom third of all taxes of the of the 100 counties in, uh, in, in, in the state. So we have low taxes. Our job is that we just need to keep them low. Okay, so we do a good job, and if you look at our taxes compared to the rest of the country, oh my God, it's a steal. So once again, glass half, glass half full, but it's a great place. Thank you, man. I met with some people the other day from the Washington, D.C., Maryland area, they were saying we cannot believe how low your tax rate is, and they were telling us what, telling me what theirs were. That's where I grew up, so I. Oh my! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, we uh, we're out of time, but I, I'm sure they'll be happy to speak with you as soon as we're done, um, because I just wanted to be uh, mindful of everyone's time to get you out on time here today at 1:30. We're so thankful for you all joining us. This concludes the 2022 Raleigh Chamber State of the City, County, and Schools. Thanks to our panelists and leaders here for joining us today. Please visit RaleighChamber.org/events to view upcoming events, and we hope to see you at another event soon. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.